All right, so let's get started into matrices. So just a review, we have scalars, and scalars are just a single value. So they're just in MATLAB, they're still stored as a matrix, but they only have one row, one column, a single position. Then we have vectors, and these are row vectors and column vectors, which have one length in either the number of rows or columns. So this is one by one, right? This is one by n, and then this one is n by one. Then you have bulm matrices that have n number of rows, m number of columns. So with this, we can actually go higher than this. So this is a one dimensional, this is a two dimensional matrix. What about three dimensional? Well, if we look at what, what that means, when we look at one dimensional, we look at a line, right? So 1D is a line, 2D is multi-dimensional, meaning like you have an X and a Y, like some plot. 3D is an actual physical object taking up space because it's got some depth to that two dimension. 4D is what? Well, for us, really, that will look like you have this slider. Because let's say in the 2D, you have this slider. And the slider is the X and the Y, right? So you can uh, go in between those and find the value of the Y at that X. With 3D, you can go along the x, the y, and the z. With 4D, you have another dimension. So essentially, you're adding one more slider. And then you have a x, y, and z at this point, and x, y, and z at this point, this point, this point. So effectively, what it can look like is you have cubes, where you have one cube here, and then you have like a bigger cube, for example. And these are all at different levels of your fourth dimension. So that's the first, second, third, for example. Uh, whatever it is. But the point being, you have this other slider where on the third you had X, Y, and Z. Fourth, you have another axis you're working on and because that's more than we have in 3d space uh, it's difficult for us to visualize but effectively the way i like to think about it is with the 1d you have a line with the 2d you have many lines with this extra dimension here with the 3d you have the many lines on the many lines. So now you have a, another one. And then with the 4D, you have the first one, then you have the second one. And the first one is the many lines within the many lines. And then the second one is other many lines. Let's say it's longer, it's a different form. But in any case, the idea is just that you're stacking them on top of each other. It's just that like, if you had this in a box, then you got another box stacked on it with all your three dimensional stuff there. So you got this, this stacked on itself, this stacked on itself, and then stacks of the 3D over top of each other. So just like that, you can apply that in MATLAB with higher dimensional matrices. So just as I can have an N by M matrix, I can create a 3D matrix. So if I actually just do this as a little piece of paper, like if this matrix was a piece of paper with all of its rows and all of its columns, right? That's my first layer of matrix. And then I could have another layer above it that's got same number of rows and columns, but different values in each of these spots, right? And then I could have another one. 
right? So it's that page layered on top of each other. And then with the fourth dimension, we can again just layer those on top of each other. So now I have another layer with all different values. And this is the one point in the fourth dimension. This is the next point in the fourth dimension. How does that actually look in MATLAB? Well, if we look here, if I have my scalar, I can just write it without even including the matrix, uh, the brackets to create the matrix, or I can include it, it does the same thing. Vector one to 10 matrix 2D would be one, two, three, and include the brackets to make this one, two, three, semicolon to go into the next row, four, five, six, and then the matrix 3D. How would I do this? So the comma moves it into the next column. The semicolon moves it into the next row. Is there a way to do it where I have like a period, put it into the next column? So effectively, if I want it to have one, two, three, four, at first layer in the third dimension, and then three, seven, nine, 11, at the second location in the third dimension, can I do that? Well, the answer is yes. You might expect it to be one, two, three, four, and then like a period going to the next in the third dimension. And then here we've got a three, seven, nine, 11, right? But that's not how MATLAB likes to do three-dimensional. That's just how it does two-dimensional. Three and higher will use a different approach. So if I wanted to specify this matrix, I can do it in this way, or I could do it this way, right? With defining row one is one to three, row two is four to six, and the first row, all the columns, is row one. And the second row is row two. And when I run this, I need to comment this out. Now when I run it, matrix two, matrix two D, the first is one, two, three, four, five, six. And then it creates just the first row, because that's all we gave it. And then we gave it the second row, and it updated it to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So just as we were able to create this 2D matrix going by stacking the 1Ds on top of each other, the way we can do a 3D is stack the 2Ds on top of each other. So where we want the first be one, two, three, four, three, seven, nine, eleven. Now I can do uh, all the rows, all the columns first in the third dimension. If I want this one to be the first and this one to be the second, then I would do matter one. And if I wanted that to be the second. Uh, make that the second. And when it runs it, well, let me suppress all but the final one. There, when it runs it, it'll say matrix 3D, and it'll just print out the first and third dimension as a two-dimensional, and the second in the third dimension as a two-dimensional. So that is how we can create 3D. This is useful because the point, typically with higher dimensions, is you want a variance in specific parameters. So let's say you're working on a machine and you are recording, say you're just tracking it, something spinning and you're recording its rotational velocity over time. So you get out something, you know, whatever it is, velocity time. So you have this vector of data, right? You have the velocity one time one, velocity two at time one, velocity three at time one, and so on. Then 
you could vary and have it look at the different days. So let's say you have, let's say you have your velocity here. So let's just do this, call it velocity one, one. Now this is time two and day one. This is velocity two, one, and then time three and day one, velocity three, one, and just keep going. Then we have day two that has another set of velocities and that's velocity one, two. Now this is velocity two, two, and this is velocity three, two, and so on going with more days and more times. But this way you can store the velocity at time one for a set of days, and then the velocity at time two for a set of days, so that it's not just time one and day one, and not having the time one for day two, is how you store it across multiple dimensions. Now with a 3D, you may want to store it for machine one and machine two and machine three so that you got time one day one that's v11 but it's also machine one so v111 and this is time two day one still machine one and then going on and here you have v121 because we're on day two this is v two two one and going on and going on and then for your two dimensional matrix fitting into the second in the third dimension for this you would have the same thing except except right here you'd have v one one two and v two one two and V1, 2, 2, and V2, 2, 2, and so on. And then you could do this with machine three. You do it with more rows, more columns, fitting in extra times and days. But then you could vary with uh, machine one, part one, uh, like different parts are spinning at different speeds. So you're tr keeping track of one part in the first of the fourth dimension so then you can break this into part one part two and then in matlab right if you're storing all these numbers in here because these are just stand-ins for whatever numbers you put in here for here so my v111 if it's 10 or whatever it is if i call this whole matrix velocities so Let's say I wanted time one, day one, machine one, part two. That's how I would get that. If I wanted all of the machines with part two, I would say, and still velocity one, day one, I would say velocities of time one, day one, machine, say all of them, what part two? Because I use colon to see all of them. Let's look here. So an easy way to create higher dimensional matrices is if I were to use the ones, looking at the example from before, let's say I have 10 times, three days, five machines, and four parts for each machine. When I run this, it will create a lot of outputs because it has 10 rows and three columns in each location here, but then it's got, if I scroll up to the top here, let me do a CLC and pull up ants, scroll to the top. So it'll populate all the rows and columns because it knows how to display that easily. Just a 2D matrix, all the rows and columns for machine one and the part one in that machine one. So everything in here is ones just because we just made it ones for simplicity's sake. But if we wanted like the first time in the first day of machine one, part one, it would be this. 
if we wanted the fourth machine, part two, we'd have to scroll all the way down to fourth machine, part two, and find whatever time and day we want. So that's how you could store multiple sets of information. In order to create it actually, I'd have to have data machine one day uh machine one part one is and let's say I've got velocities across the time for day one or one two three four five and then for day two it's two three four five six and for day three it's five six seven eight nine so now to put this let's say I had machine one part two I would just create data, all of the times, all of the days, machine one, part one, equals data, machine one, part one. And then I could populate part two with part two. And now I've only got that much in data. Do this again, data. It has what I had for part one, machine one, in machine one, part one, and then it has what I put in there for machine one, part two. So that's typically how it works at the higher dimensions. You have the different parameters that you have the different sets of data for, and then you have your base row and column that you can just look at here for each of the variances in this parameter. So that's how you do that with higher dimensional matrices. Now, let's go into more plotting. So, some plotting. We talked about, let's say we have uh, a die and it's zero and I'm going up increments and I go to two pi. And then if I plot the radii, oops, versus sine of radii, we can predict what this will look like, right? It'll just be a sinusoidal curve. Well, there's some things I can do with this. Lots of fancy things. I can do grid on, for example. Grid on will flip on these gray lines so I can see the grids for each increment of X and Y here. Uh, we already talked about X label. Let's say radii, radians, and Y label sine of theta. I can do a new figure with figure. I can also specify in here, you have line types, you have point types, and you have colors as the basic three. So your options for line types are dashed, solid is the default, dash dot and you can actually see that if I do this if I do dash dot and run this didn't show it up but when I close it it'll pop up and here you can see now I've got a dot dash so these are the main ones I'll use uh, there's other options that you can do, you can see what they are by doing help plot. And here you can see there's another option, but we'll go into that in a second. So here are the three main ones. Uh, solid. Got it is another one with a colon. Double dash uh, or double minus is dashed. Then for point types, you have period for point, O for circle, X for an X, X for a plus. The points are pretty obvious. Uh, the first ones, just, they just show that character at that point. Uh, then you've got star, square, diamond. Anyway, you can go and read this, but I'll just type it out. And then you've got colors. This will be the color of the line, so blue. So you can make these any combination you want. Let's say I wanted a magenta color, and I want point and I want it dotted. Well, when I run this, it's now magenta, and it's points at the points, and it's dotted. 
So let's say instead I want it uh, O point type solid and you don't want to promise here, but then I want it to be black. Well, there we go. Now we got it. So that's how that works. Again, if you want to plot like radii and cosine of radii, then you could give that another set. Let's say you want to do less than, you want to do W or not W because our background's white. So let's not do that. Let's do green and dashed. Now when I run this, the one has the triangles and the other has the circles and they're the different colors. So that works. And then of course we'd want to do a legend. And this is why you'd want to make it look different because then your legend will tell whoever's looking at it if they're both a solid black. Then when I make this legend, it's not going to be very helpful as you'll see. So legend and the first is sign. Second is cosine. Let's run this. Sine and cosine, oh, that's super helpful because they're both black solid lines. I still can't tell. So, of course, I want to change it to blue and maybe a dash to make it extremely obvious. The difference now, okay, the dashed line is the cosine. So, great, that helps us differentiate between the two. And certain sets of data will look better with, with different setups. So, let's say I had dotted. If I did uh, cosine of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 to 2 pi. Whoops. I won't be able to do that because they're not the same size. The cos, the radii and output of this cosine. So I'll do the same. So now I've got a dotted line, right? But let's say I had solid and asterisk it's got so many asterisks if i zoom in gotta do it a lot because i did way too many points but here you can see it's just asterisks but they're all overlaid over each other so it doesn't visually look like you would expect and probably hope so that's why in this case you probably wouldn't want to include a point up like this you just want to maybe change to dashed and then do red for example and you may have noticed I mixed and meshed where these were arranged. So I typically myself do the color, then the line type, then the point type, but it doesn't actually matter. It's just because it's what I'm used to. You're welcome. And MATLAB will be fine with you doing whatever order here because it doesn't have like a K for the line type. So it'd be confused. Okay. Are you talking about line type or color here? It's got these options for colors which are different from these options for point types, which are different from these options for line types. And it'll know you're talking about the line type with this because it's different than the point types and colors. So that's great. Let's look at another option. Uh, so when we pulled up help for plot, we saw this right here. So this we know is uh, plots the X and the Y. Let's just duplicate this example. and format this properly. Then if I do plot of x, y, and double dash r, s, that will be a square for the point type, red, and it will be dashed. And we can check that. Yes, there we go. That allows us to feed in a set of characters, or we can do strings. I prefer strings, but it'll work either way. And then if I look in here, I can see all the different options I have. So for example, the first one is line width. Let's look where line width is. It's up here because they're not entirely alphabetical. The line width and here's my value. So line width, the default is 0.5. Let's say I want it a tenth of that. Now it's 0.5. And let's see if we can actually tell a difference there. We can't. Reason being, it's 
it's limited in its minimum value. So if I had this huge, you can tell a huge difference, right? You would really never want it that size. But let's say you want it 2 instead of 0.5 to make it a bit thicker. But if I did 0001, it would be too small. So MATLAB will limit it as to the minimum size. So that's line width. If I go back here and I look at another one, there's color and line color does 0 0.4470 and 0 0.7410 is the default and it's RGB triplet. It's asking for how much red, how much green and how much blue for the color. So this is how much red, first one, how much blue, second, how much green, the third. And this is actually how computers typically store, like if you have an image, it'll store it in RGB and that's because the pixels on your computer, instead of being one pixel that varies from black, or it can be red, or it can be green, or it can be blue, whatever it is, what this actually does is it has three pixels, a red, green, and a blue. So we can specify ourselves if we want it to be all red for example we do all red zero green and zero blue and we can max it out with one here so 0.5 would be 50 percent of the maximum red so if we wanted full red here we make full red if we wanted full green here we'd make it full green and so on and we could look up online if i look up what is uh, purple in RGB? So I'll do 106, 13, 173. But the way this is storing it is it's out of 254. I will do this, divide by 254. And now when I run this, I'll get a purple. So I can get a purple by mixing red, little green, and a lot of blue, right? Because purple is red and blue. And you can go through and see your own options here. You can see what does, for example, marker face color do? Well, you can type it in and then do none. Run this, you can see it doesn't change a lot. So some things will not be super obvious and you'll not really have to worry about changing it because this is just for you visually. But then another, like the line width or like marker size, that'll make a big difference, as you can see. So there you can play around with that. Next thing we'll go into is subplotting. So. If we want to have this plot and this plot, we can plot them on new figures, right? So I can just type in figure here. And when I run this, it will create the two figures, right? That may be what I want, but let's say, instead of having these two directly overlaid on each other, as I could do with either this or this with a hold, right? If I hold on and I hold off, that will overlay it just as before. But let's say I don't want to overlay it. I want it on the same figure, but I want it in like plots on top of each other. Well, the option for this is subplot. So the way this works, create a new figure and I'll take my two plots and I'll just take all of this and use only what I need. So I'll take out grid let's say i don't want a grid take out the hold and keep the x label and y label so the way you do subplots is i say subplot m is the number of rows as you can see it pops up here number of grid rows so let's say i want it to be like this where it's got the one plot here and the one plot here so as you know, just like with the matrices, that'll be row one, that'll be row two. Now I'll just have one column. 
So I'm going to go here. I want two rows. And then the second is number of grid columns. So I want one column. And then P is grid position. The way it'll do that is it'll just go through. And for this, it'll just go through. Let's say I have a bunch of plots on that figure. It'll just go through column by column and it'll do the first one. That'll be one, second one, two, third one, three, and then we we'll go to the next column, four, the row after that, five, and then six. So this would be the first one because it's just two, one on top of the other. Now I do the exact same thing because I still want two rows, one column, you'll keep that part the same. You'll just change the index or the location for this new set of axes. So if I want this one on top of this one, then I do this. If I want this one to be on the bottom, the sign on the bottom, then I would do this. So when I save and run this, I won't need legend. It'll pop up this warning, meaning of course, an error is it'll stop the code. Warning is you probably don't want this, but it'll keep running the code. And it's just notifying me, of course, that I only have one plot on this axis now. And so it won't do a legend. It won't like it because it'll only have the one in it. So you here we have 212 and 211. So this is the bottom of the sign, right? And as you can see, that doesn't have any X labels or Y labels. So I could copy that up to here. And instead of using the axes to differentiate, because here I really would just do function of theta because it's not just sign. And instead of using legend, I would use the y axes are separate now. So the top one and this one. So now when I do it, I've got cosine of theta and sine of theta. Uh, but I still don't have the title and I just need one. So this is the best title. So now it, uh, it titles it. So if I were to include a title up above, what would that do? Let's include both. Let's see what it does. This is the best title. This is the best title too. So what it will do is it will override with the second one because initially I said it, but uh, because it's still on one figure, it only wants one. So it'll just override. This is the best title with this is the best title too. So that's subplotting. Another way of plotting is logarithmic plotting. So what this is, is if I have x is 1 to 1,000, and y is 2 to the power of x. And express these. If I plot x and y, I need to do dot. I need to close all for that to work right. So as you can see, it's a little bit difficult to see, in fact, but it's got this blue line, and it's going Zero looks real low and then real quick shoots up at the end there all the way up to like the top point is 1.07151 times 10 to the 301. That's really high. Now, when we looked at that, right, when we looked at that, that's sort of hard to see that information. So one way that I can actually do this is I can do a semi-log x with my x and y and I'll hide this semi log x so now what it's doing is it changed the values on the x if we go back and I have these two and separate figures now initially the x was 0 to 1000 in even increments steps of 100 now it's 10 to the power of 0 10 to the power of 1, 10 to the power of 2, 10 to the power of 3. So this is a logarithmic scale here on the x, meaning that 10 to the 0 is 1, of course. 10 to the 1 is 10. This is 10 to the 0.2. This is 10 to the 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. And so that's 
the x that is plotting right there and then the y is exactly the same if i do semi log y of x and y you'll see now it becomes a perfect line where it's still the same data it's still 2 to the x so it still goes all the way up to 10 to 300 but here it's a line and that's because our data is logarithmic on the y so when we have linear on the x logarithmic on the y then we get a line out so this makes it much easier to visualize certain types of data if you then plot it with logarithmic scale on y you can get out a close to linear plot so this is what you'd want to use when you have certain type of data that would be conducive to using logarithmic plots and then finally we've got log log and what this does is a log on x and y so remember it went all the way over like right here before it started curving up before so now it's curving up it's got a much smoother curve that's because we're doing a logarithmic plot on x and y so yeah that's all about the type of data you're dealing with so depending on what industry you go into you may or may not find that useful but it's a important thing to remember because sometimes visualizing data logarithmic plots is helpful like that so next one is plot three and what plot three is for plot normal plot we had a vector of x's and then a vector of y's right with plot three we have a vector of x's we have a vector of y's and we have a vector of z's and then you'll fit it in like you might expect x y z and when i give let's say x is 0 0.12 i if y is sine of x and then z is cosine of x when i plot this and do a close all you can see it plots and it uh, it just goes through and for the first x y and z it plots that as a point and then it plots a line to the second x y and z if i click close enough here here i can get my x is zero y is zero and then for that because x at zero is zero uh y at zero is sine of zero which is zero and z at zero is cosine of zero which is one and then at x is point two sine of point two is that cosine of point two is that so when we actually rotate this and i'll do labels on the plot so i can see this x label angle y label sign and cosine for the z So when I look at sine versus cosine, or let's look at angle versus cosine. When I rotate it, you can see it, it looks like a cosine, right? So we can see it'll just be a layer or a expanding out of that cosine into the 3D curve of it. But then when we plot sine versus cosine, we get a circle, right? So we get a circle this direction, we get a cosine this direction, and then we get a spiral this direction. So that's how you can, uh, you can work with that. Okay, so that's plotting in 3D. Now let's look at F plot. An F plot is an interesting one. I'll pull up the doc for f plot. F plot of f, and if we scroll down to an example, plot sine of x over the default x interval minus five to five. So if I do this, it does exactly that. Plots sine of x from negative 5 to 5 
So it said default x interval negative 5 to 5. If I go up to the description here, if I say f plot f and then f plot f comma x interval. So let's try alter this and let's go from 0 to 2 pi. There we go. So we're successfully able to modify this. We're doing y is sine of x, x is x, and then we're doing it from x is 0 to 2 pi. Now, as you might imagine, we could change this, cosine of x, we can do cosine, we can do tangent, and so forth. And it will smartly pick the steps so that we get smooth curves. So this makes it simpler for us to, instead of having to pick, like here I had to create my own matrix of X's and I had to pick the increment here. Here, it will smartly pick the increment so that I just get out an X chosen with the bounds or with automatic from negative five to five. So. I can also say tangent of x plus cosine of x. And it's smart enough. This is a plot for tangent of x plus cosine of x. And it's smart enough to figure that out. So basically, you can take some x input, and it will smartly pick the range and calculate the outputs and stuff, everything for you. Because this is the same as doing plot x, y, where x is 0 and some increment, it smartly picks this. But from 0 to 2, i to match. And then figure, but y is tangent of x plus cosine of x. And here we go. So as you can see, the F plot, we have a little nicer of a plot here, despite us using the same thing. Uh, and that's because it will interpret asymptotes and things like that. So that's why you'd want to use something like F plot when you're plotting a function. Like obviously you can't, obviously you can't plot data with this, right? It's just, this is a function of our input. But another thing you can do with F plot is if I create my symbolic and let's say I do sims uh, x and I do symbolic is tangent of x plus cosine of x or whatever my symbolic equation I want is, then I can do f plot of x or, uh, sorry, not x, symbolic. And when I plot this, to show, show this here, it plots the same thing a little bit differently, but it, it's able to plot it as well. So you're able to plot symbolics. That's another reason, like when we had the equation that we then solve, we could then plot it with fplot. So we're learning like these things build on each other. So with F plot, we're able to use the symbolics we used before, whereas we've primarily been dealing with numerics. So F plot is a little bit different. It likes this, which we'll talk about a little bit more later is a function handle. So it allows you to put functions in here. Like if I just add cos, it'll just plot the cosine. So you're able to use function handles to create what you want here. And you are able to use symbolics to create what you want here. And again, we'll talk about the function handles later. So that's how you plot symbolics. OK. Next, we'll talk about surf. And surf is an interesting one. So surf is back to numbers, not functions or symbolics. But what surf does. Well, let's look at the equation PV equals NRT that we looked at before. So let's say with this, we've got a 
set of P's and V's that we want to calculate the T for. And our N's and R's are constants. So let's say N is 1, R is 1, and T is a matrix from 0 to 1,000. And let's start at 1. From 1 to 1,000, V is also 1 to 1,000. Then to calculate my temperature, if I just did P times V divided by N divided by or divided by n times r. When I plot this, it won't like it because it's trying to do matrix multiplication. So I swap to element by element multiplication, and it's fine with that now. So there I can plot three, and I'll plot the p, the v, and the t right here. And as soon as I do all this, I'm able to get a 3D plot where it's X is the pressure, Y is the volume, and Z is the temperature. If I turn axis on, axis, grid, on, I can see grids on the background. It'll help me visualize a little bit easier. So that's that. but. Let's say these are the P's I want to deal with, but I just want to look at volumes of 10 to 15. Okay. Now when I do this, it won't like it because when it's trying to calculate T, it's got a P with some values, it's got a V with other values because these aren't tied to each other. I just want to look at a set of pressures and a set of volumes. And I want to look at, for this pressure, all of these volumes and then get all of the temperatures for that. So the way we can do this is with mesh grid. And what it takes is my P and my V. And I get out, P out, V out. And it creates a 2D array of P's and V's so that, uh, let's go simpler here to start with for the example. So in this case, I have a P V equals N R T. And so I want P to be one, two, three, four, five, all the way to 10. And I want V to be 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Okay, now I want for each P to look at each V and then find out the temperature for that. Because th again, these are constants, so they can sort of be ignored here. We're dealing with complexity due to matrix size. And this P is not the same size as V, and in any case, we want for each P to have each V. So the way we could do this is make our new P have as many rows as this has columns. So I can say one, and then it goes one with the 10. And I'll try and fit this one, two, three, four, five, six. So one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, five, six. And I want each of these to mesh with a V that will be 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So now I've got uh, matching points here, matching locations where I've got a 1 with a 10, a 1 with an 11, a 1 with a 12, 13, 14, 15. And now I also want two for each of those, for my 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So you might notice the pattern, but I'll just go through and I'll say for my P, I basically just extend it, duplicate this row so that I've got as many rows as I've got columns in this and then rotate this and duplicate that new column across however many columns I've got here. And then I've got matching sizes and 
when I multiply these using not matrix, but right, and this keeps going. So I get completely done with, with all the way to 10 here. But when I do a T equals T and then element by element dot multiply V divide by N divide by R, this will get me in the first spot for P of one, for V of 10, it'll calculate my T. For a P of two, for V of 10, it'll calculate my new T. For P of three, V of 10, it'll calculate my new T. So it'll create a T that's the same size as my P and V, my new P and V, not the originals. So that's how we can create a matrix in varying this parameter P across some values, doesn't matter how many, right? Because we'll just have to expand this V to match that. But we could have this go on to a thousand, right? It would just make this more columns here, but it'll just make this matching in more columns. So it'll work perfectly together. So when I go back to this, the way we do this is using mesh grid. Mesh grid will automatically construct this 2D matrix from these vectors of above here and it will work equally if I did P comma V or V comma P. I'll just need to match the order. Uh, if I do P and V, then P then B, V, or if I do V then P, then I do V then P. So P out, V out. Uh, these will be different things, but it'll just be reorganizing this so that if I looked at this here, now I've got it where this point will have to split off into each of these. And so I will swap it to V. So V will be 10 in the first column all the way down until we've gotten 10 times because there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So I'll need 10 in here. I got five. And now I've got my 10. So now I've got this and I'll just have my 11s here. And then my 12s. Okay. All the way going down to 15, All right? 15, two, three, five and I've got match right so that's my new v which you can see is not the same they're not equal but they will produce with my new p of the same size my p is now like my v before so now it'll have one 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 for 10 11 12 13 14 15 so one two three four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then two, 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 all the way down to 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, right? So this will produce different matrices and yet it'll be the same size to multiply with each other and it'll work just fine so that doesn't matter if I pick PV and PV or VP and VP. I just need to match. So let's just go with this one. And now, again, I multiply, but instead of P and V, I do P out and V out with my N and R. Doesn't matter because they're scalars. So I could do dot divide, I could do divide, it wouldn't care. And then instead of plot three, plot expects a vector of values and then P to be a vector of values and T to be a vector of values. But P is a vector, V is a vector, but T is not a vector. So instead of plot three, what we'll use is surf. And instead of P and V, we'll use our P out, V out, and T, which is the calculation of the multiplication of the two. 
And if this were a function where it was p plus v, then it would work perfectly fine. It doesn't matter, right, that it happens to be multiply. You just are computing this t here using the dot multiplication or whatever element by element operation if it was dot divide, if it were plus, if it were minus, if it were dot power, any of those would work. And in this case, it's dot multiply. So p out to v out and t, I feed into, feed into surf. And now when I plot this, I get, it's interesting. So it's a 3D plot, but it's a grid unlike before. Now, if I look at a P of one, V of 10, then I get a Z of 10. So basically it, uh, if I look down on this, I have my P and V, and it's just a grid uh, at, of the matrices I produced over here, right? The one, two, three, 10 to 10. The reason it's doing this coloring is it automatically just does darker colors or cooler colors below and warmer colors above. And there's ways to change that, but this achieves what we super care about right now. So that's surf. When you have sets of P's and V's that you wanna vary and look at every set of P with every set of V, then you use a mesh grid and surf instead of a plot three. And let's kind of summarize the use of everything. So if you have a function or symbolic you want to plot. It's 2D. Then you do F plot, right? If you have data that's, that's easier visualized at logarithmic scale, you have semi log X my log y and log log then if you have a set of vectors with an x a y and a z you can plot on a 3d plot some points x y z similar to normal plot. This is plot three. And then you have surf. And surf is if you have x's and you got some vector. Got some y's that is a vector. And you got an equation or something to plug these x's and y's into so that you can get for each of these x's, you have for each of these y's, so for any combination of x's and y's, you get out some z's. With varying x's and y's. And that's all filled. So here you use mesh grid to convert these into x's be a big matrix and Y's to be a big matrix. And then you do surf with X, Y, and Z, where this is your X, not the original, this is your Y, not the original, and this is your Z. So. Those functions f plot, semi logs, and log, plot three, and mesh grid and sir. Okay. And now we have a few more. We've got polar. And polar plot is where you have, instead of like Cartesian coordinates, Cartesian is where you have some X and Y, right? And you have a grid layout where this, um, this is at that X and that Y is at that X and that Y, right? With polar, you have 
a point isn't at an xy, it's at a angle theta and a distance out r, right, from trigonometry. So that's a polar. We can do polar plots, which will, instead of x and y, we have r and theta. It's polar. Pi is if you have an amount of data and you want to break it in to sections. So you've got this is the green amount, this is the blue amount, this is the gray, black and light gray, right? That's a pi, just like you'd expect with pi, pi chart or plot. Then you got a bar. So you can break it up one, two, three, four. And with the bar, you've just got an amount of data where you have three, four, one, four, for example. And this just stores the quantities in each of these bars. And then you've got histogram. So let's say you have 100, 10, 100, 99, 50. Then it will do something like 0, 100. And it will have 0, 25, 50, 75. And it will have 3, 75 to 100. 1 in 0 to 25 one in the 50 to 75 and zero in the 25 to 50. So that's histogram. And so we've got polar, pi, bar, and our histogram. So let's quick pull up some examples here. Here we go. So we've got polar. Say I don't know how to do polar. I could type help polar. And gives me an example here. So polar figure got T's and I'll do pullers with that T and some R. So this is my R. Now when I plot this, we got this fancy looking flower. And the way this is working is it goes for angles from zero to two pi. So it circles around, starts at angle of zero, and let's reduce this so that you can see easier. So only rotate around the pi over eight. So it'll go from zero and at zero, this will return zero. So I've got zero, zero in the center there. And then as soon as I get to pi over eight, it'll be all the way out at an R of 0.5, basically. So that's great. And then once I get to pi over four, it circles back in. And then I'll go from pi over four to 2 pi over 4 and it does this section so instead of circling out right here it does the negative so it goes around like that and then it keeps going so that when we do the 0 to all the way around the 2 pi we get the flower look from before so that's how you do polar you can do things like title with polar polar how about pi? So let's do pi and x. Let's say for when I have 10, then 20, and 30, then 100. So let's say this were for a set of contestants. I could do a legend, contestant. Let's just call them one. Contestant one, but I'll just say one for the first two, three, four. So when I do this, 
it will give me the first contestant got 6%, second got 12% of the whatever. Uh, let's say you had a total number of eggs collected. Uh, the first cont contestant got 6% of the eggs. If they got 10, second contestant got twice that. So they got 12%, the 19, 62%. So that's pie chart, like you might expect. Then we've got bar chart. And bar is just like the pie chart effectively. If I feed in the same thing, it'll just linearly show it. So do this one more time. And if I want all of these, I'll just put a figure above them. So got the polar, then my pie and my bar. So my pie. 62% was calculation of 100. So this effectively showing the same thing as the bar, bar chart, but in percentage format of the total 100%. Uh, and then you don't need a legend, of course, in the bar chart because it's just it just gives you one, two, three, four. Um, these are the contestants, one, two, three, and four. So you just remove that. But that's how that works. And then finally, histogram. We look at this. Histogram. If I can successfully type histogram. Histogram. Run this. That will be totally flat. And the reason is it did it as a one single point. So it's got four. Uh, going from 0 to 100. So that's probably not what I want to see if I want to get it to show how I want to see it. I can do doc histogram. And I look here. I just gave it one input. So that's histogram plot of x. And then n bins uses a number of bins specified by a scalar or a single numerical value and bins. So let's say I wanted it separated into five. Now I have 10 to 28 is my bin there. And I could change this. If I wanted a hundred, I just have a lot of bins with zeros in it. And I'll just have one between between 9.9 .9 and 10.8, one between 19.811 and 20.712. So basically the histogram is useful for more data, right? If I did randomly generated matrix uh, with one row thousand columns or 10,000, multiply that by 10. And I separate it into hundred columns it's going to say, okay, I got 118 between 0 and 0 0.1. Whereas I've got 92 between 9.9 .9 and 10. So depending on, I could reduce this. I could just have 10. I'll have a lot bigger numbers with a lot fewer splits here. But it's just the way to see a spread of data. I can use rand n. And you can see n is another function in MATLAB. It'll create a normal distribution. If I pull up doc and n, it does a standard normal distribution, whereas the rand just creates some fairly evenly, as you saw before. So now we've got a Gaussian distribution. And if I were to do this, I could see more incrementally the Gaussian distribution. So there we go. Those are the plots that are important to recognize with MATLAB. There are some others, but these are the primary options. Thanks very much.